to get him out of Russia originally. That's right. The CIA transported him here. He was supposed to give them all sorts of information, but he never delivered. When he first got to New York, he sold babies out of an apartment in Brooklyn. According to the stories, in one day alone, he sold six babies to suburban couples for $10,000 apiece. More recently, he swindled a Miami bank out of $200 million. He likes what he does, and he's obviously good at it. And now we know an Internet site he visits. We may even be able to get on the site. We're working on it. We're as close to the wolf as we've ever been, or so we'd like to believe. Chapter 79 The wolf was in Philadelphia that night, birthplace of a nation, though not his nation. He never showed it, but he was anxious, and he liked the emotional charge it gave him. It made him feel more alive. He also liked it that he was invisible, that no one knew who he was, that he could go anywhere, do anything he wanted to do. Tonight, he was watching the Flyers play Montreal at the first Union Center in Philly. The hockey game was one he had arranged to have fixed, but nothing had happened so far, which was why he was anxious and also very angry. As the second period was winding down, the score was two to one, Flyers. He was seated at center ice, four rows back behind the penalty boxes, close to the action. To distract himself, he watched the crowd, a mix of yuppies in business suits and loosened ties and blue-collar types and oversized Flyers jerseys. Everybody seemed to have plastic tubs of nachos and 20-ounce cups of beer. His eyes shifted back to the game. Players flashed around the rink at dazzling speeds, making a slashing sound as the blades of their skates tore into the ice. Come on, come on, do something, he urged. Then suddenly he saw Ilya Teptev out of position. There was the shotgun crash of a slap shot as it left the stick. Goal, Canadiens. The crowd erupted with insults. You suck, Ilya. You throw in this game? Then the announcer came over the PA. Canadian goal by number 18, Stevie Bowen. Time of goal, 19 minutes and 32 seconds. The period ended like that, two to two. The Zamboni chugged out, resurfacing the ice between periods. More beer and more nachos were consumed, and the ice became a slick glass sheet once again. For the next 16 minutes, the game was knotted at 2-2. Two to two. The Wolf wanted to garret Teptev and Dabushkin. Then the Canadian center, Bowen, plowed through a half-hearted check and burst into the flyer zone. He dropped a pass along the right boards. A shot! Wide! recovered by Alexei Dubushkin, who settled behind his own net with the puck. He skated to his right, then snapped a pass across the ice, across the goal mouth, and it was picked off by Bowen. Bowen slapped the puck into the corner of the net. Goal, Canadiens! The wolf smiled for the first time that night. Then he turned to his companion, his seven-year-old son, Dimitri, whose existence would have surprised everyone who supposedly knew the wolf. Let's go, Dimi. The game's over. The Canadians will win, just like I told you they would. Didn't I tell you? Dimitri wasn't convinced about the outcome, but he knew better than to argue with his father. You are right, Daddy, said the boy. You're always right. Chapter 80 That night at 11.30, I planned to enter the wolf's den for the first time. I needed the help of Mr. Potter, though. Homer Taylor had been moved to Washington for the purpose. I needed his eyes. The two of us sat close together, Taylor in cuffs, in an operation room on the fifth floor of the Hoover. The professor was nervous, and I guessed that he was having second thoughts about our arrangement with respect to the wolf. Don't think that he won't get to you. He's relentless. He's crazy. He warned me again. I've avoided crazy men before, I said. We still have a deal? We do. What choice do I have? But you'll regret it. So will I, I'm afraid. We're going to protect you. His eyes narrowed. So you say. The night had been a busy one already. The top computer experts at the Bureau had tried password-cracking software to get into the wolf's den. So far... 
everything had failed. So had a brute force attack that could often decode encrypted data by feeding in combinations of letters and numbers. Nothing had worked. We needed Mr. Potter to get inside. We needed his eyes. The blood vessel patterns of the retina and the pattern of flecks on the iris provided unique methods of identification. Scanning involved a low-intensity light source and an optical coupler. Potter put one eye up to the device and then focused on a red dot. An impression was taken and then sent on. Seconds later, we had access. This is Potter, I typed, as Taylor was let out of the operations room. He would be transferred to Lorton Federal Prison for the night, then taken back to New England. I put him out of my mind, but I wouldn't be able to forget his warning about the wolf. We were just talking about you, said someone with the username Master Trekker. I wondered why my ears were buzzing. I typed and wondered if I was communicating with the wolf for the first time. Was he online? If so, where was he? What city? I was center stage in the operation room used by Psyoc. More than a dozen agents and technicians were gathered around me. Most were on computers, too. The scene looked like a very high-tech classroom. Master Trekker. Weren't really talking about you, Potter. You are paranoid, same as it ever was. I looked at the other usernames. Sphinx 3000. Tosca Bella. Louis 15th. Sterling 66. No wolf. Did that mean he wasn't online in the den? Or was he Master Trekker? Was he observing me now? Was I passing his test? I need a replacement for Worcester, I typed. Potter had told me that Francis Deegan's code name was Worcester. Sphinx 3000. Take a number. We were talking about my package, my delivery. It's my turn. You know that, you fruitcake. I didn't respond at first. This was my first test. Would Potter apologize to Sphinx 3000? I didn't think he would. More likely, he'd come back with a caustic reply. Or would he? I chose to say nothing for now. Sphinx 3000. Fuck you, too. I know what you are thinking, you kinky bastard. Sphinx 3000. As I was saying before I was interrupted, I want a southern belle. The more hung up on herself, the more self-absorbed she is, the better. I want an ice goddess who I plan to shatter, totally into herself. She wears Chanel and, and Mew Mew and uh, Bulgari jewelry, even to the shopping mall. Heels, of course. I don't care if she's tall or short, beautiful face, pert tits. Toscabella. How original. Sphinx 3000. Fuck original. Sorry to repeat myself, but fuck you. Give me that old time rock and roll music. I want what I want, and I've earned it. Sterling 66. Anything else? The southern belle of yours? In her 20s? 30s? Sphinx 3000. That'd be good. All or any of the above. Louis 15th. Teens? Sterling 66. How long do you plan to keep her around? Sphinx 3000. One glorious night of ecstasy and wild abandon. Just one night. Sterling 66. And then? Sphinx 3000. I'm going to dispose of her. Now do I get my goddess? There was a pause. No answer came from anyone. What was going on, I wondered. Of course you do. Answered Wolf. Just be careful, Sphinx. Be very careful. We are being watched. Chapter 81 I wasn't sure how to react to the wolf or his message to Sphinx. Should I speak now? Did he know we were on to him? How could he? 
Sterling, 66. Now what's your problem, Mr. Potter? This was my chance. I wanted to try and draw out Wolf if I could. But could I pull it off? I was aware that everyone was watching me in the operation room. I don't have a problem, I typed. I'm just ready for another boy. You know I'm good for it. Haven't I always been? Sterling, 66. You are ready for another boy? You just recently received Worcester, about a week ago. I typed, Yes, but he's left us. Sphinx 3000. That's very funny. You are so cute, Potter. Such a cute psycho killer. Sphinx didn't like Potter, did he? I had to assume the feeling was mutual. I typed, I love you, too. We should get together and bond in person. Sterling 66 When you say he's left us, I assume you mean that he's dead. Mr. Potter Yes, the dear boy passed. I'm over my grieving, though. Ready to move on. Sphinx 3000 Hilarious! This bickering was starting to get on my nerves. Who the hell were these sick bastards? Where were they? Besides cyberspace. I have someone in mind. I've been watching him for a while, I typed. Sphinx 3000. I'll bet he's gorgeous. I typed. Oh, he is. One of a kind. The love of my life. Sterling 66. You said that about Worcester. What city? I typed. Boston. Cambridge, actually. He's a student at Harvard. Working for his doctorate. Argentinian, I believe. Rides polo ponies in the summer. Sterling, 66. Where did you bump into this one, Potter? The next tidbit I'd gotten from Homer Taylor himself. Actually, I did bump into him. He's so firm. Sphinx, 3000. Where did you meet him? Tail, tail. I typed. I was at Harvard for a symposium. Sterling 66. On? I typed. Milton, of course. Sterling 66. He was attending? I typed. No. I literally bumped into him. In the men's room. I watched him for the rest of the day. Found out where he lived. Been studying him for three months. Sterling 66. So why did you purchase Worcester? I knew the question was coming. Impulse, I typed. Then, but this boy in Cambridge, that's true love. Not a casual thing. Sterling 66. So you have a name? An address? I typed. I do. And I have my checkbook. Sterling 66. Worcester won't be found? You are certain? I could hear Potter's voice in my head as I typed. Good Lord, no. Not unless someone goes swimming in my septic tank. Sphinx 3000. Gross, Potter. I love it. Sterling 66. Well, if you have checkbook in hand... Wolf. No. We'll wait on this. It's too soon, Potter. We'll get back to you. As always, I've enjoyed our talk. But I have other matters to attend to. Wolf signed off. He was gone. Shit. He'd come and gone just like that. The mystery man, as always. Who was this bastard? I stayed online, chatting with the others for a few minutes, expressing my disappointment at the decision, my eagerness to make a purchase. Then I left the site, too. I looked around the operation room at my colleagues. A few began to clap, partly mocking me, but mostly it was genuinely congratulatory. Cop-to-cop -cop stuff, almost like old times. I felt marginally accepted by the others in the room. For the first time, actually. Chapter 82 we waited to hear from the wolf's den. Everyone in the overcrowded room wanted to take the wolf down in the worst way. 
It was a complicated and twisted